Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. It's great to gather together. It's great to gather online as well. Uh, we're going to begin this morning uh, by singing a song together about God's love for us. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55, come all who are thirsty and, and eat and drink and sup. And we can do that because of what God has done through Jesus in sending him. So we're going to begin by reading John um, 3, verses 14 through 17. Uh, so will you stand as we begin this morning? Let's read this together as a call to worship this morning. Just as Moses lifted up the same in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he have eternal life. Amen. So we're going to sing that in song, bring ourselves, all of us, our good, our bad, the things that we're shamed about, the things that we're guilty about. We bring them to him knowing that God has demonstrated his love for us in sending Jesus, and we can take refuge and celebrate that fact this morning.
It is good to sing of God's love for the world, isn't it? I tell you what, it is just awesome to hear the praise band, to be singing together, to worship. Those of you joining us online, I just pray that you are able to really sing out and praise God with everything that he has done for us and for everything that he is in Jesus Christ. Oh my word, between what Jesus has done for us, what God has done for us, the Holy Spirit that indwells us, my friends, we are of all people most blessed. Any praises that you want to share this morning, something that God has done in your life, a passage of scripture that you've read, something that you're just like, man, I have got to tell the world that this is what Jesus has done in my life. Is there a prayer request that you have, uh, something you want to share? Kim? I'm still here. Yes, absolutely, Kim. It's been a while. I know you joined us online, but it's good to see you in person. And man, we praise God that you are here. Excellent. Any other praises, prayer requests this morning, things that you'd like to share? And if you're online, my number is probably up on the screen. You can just text it in. There is a delay. I will try to get the prayer in uh, before this time. So any uh, praises, prayer requests, anything else this morning? Well, I'd like for the university on Tuesday for some more tests and stuff. So pray everything will go well. And Kim also got to go in the hospital tomorrow because one of her tubes came up. She said they had to be replaced. So Pam is going back on Tuesday for tests. And um, Kim is in the hospital now? Not sure for tomorrow. Kim is going to the hospital tomorrow um, for a tube that came out. Okay, um, absolutely. We were praying for Kim with her cancer. We're praising God for Pam and the kidney, and everything seems to be doing well, but want to continue to pray that God will continue to guide that. Um, good. Anything else this morning? Praises, prayer requests, stuff that you want us to take to the Lord? Yes, Beth? Olivia's been released from the care of her um, school years as doctor. So. Yes. Absolutely. Anything else? I'd like to pray for my uh, aunt. And uh, she's, uh, her health is very delicate, and uh, uh, family helping with her is uh, having a rough time. Okay. So you want to pray for Walner's aunt uh, with her health being very delicate and just, oh, that's so hard when you're very trying to come together and balance that. Yes. yes, absolutely. Good. Anything else this morning? Kevin? I just want to tell everybody to stay healthy and I'm learning to live with germs. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. We're going to continue to pray for um, Dr. Richard Thomas to get through the challenge in his life. And we are obviously thrilled, uh, thrilled. We are thrilled to have Debbie with us this morning. And she was hobbling all up in. We were praying that God would uh, take care of you after your fall and your surgery. And um, I say you're going to run a marathon in a couple of months. So that's exciting. We praise God for that. Um, Barry. Uh, I had a cousin that died of COVID. I'm sorry, Barry. So your uncle is Elmer, and Charles is your cousin. Okay. Anything else? I don't see the hand I'm being pointed out. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Deborah. Sorry. Can you guys update on my mom? Okay. Uh huh. Absolutely. Anything else this morning? Yes. Uh, two, actually. Um, one, my mom had um, had to have several tests done this week. 
this week, um, follow up on her lung and heart issues. And um, when she met with Dr. Friday, he said everything looks great. Good. Um, yeah, so she's doing really, really well. And then the other thing is um, I just love to see how God works. Um, our women's Bible study started back up this past week. And then just the last couple of days, I've been doing the um, year in the Bible study. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes. I just want to put in a plug for our growth groups, man. We are like really starting to rock out with the new year. So it's exciting. Mine on Tuesday nights. If you don't have one, you're always welcome to join us. The other things that God is doing in our groups, we're just starting to see um, so many amazing things happen. I'm hearing that the young adult group is growing. The youth group was full on Wednesday night. Like God is moving. And then if you're not doing that, there's the online, the Bible read through. And we finally finished Job. It's a good time to jump in and jump right back into Abraham's story in Genesis. And so a lot of good things there. Any final uh, request? Angel. Absolutely. All right, my friends, let's take these things to the Lord in prayer, all right? God, coming to you now with a whole slew of requests and some praises. And I think that's what's important, God. It is, it is good to take this time out. I was even reading this past week of how you healed people. And some people would respond like in positive and say thank you. Others would just go right on. And God, we have a lot of things to be grateful for this morning. We have a lot of things that we can um, praise you for. And so I just want to, I just want to list off some of these things, God, that you have done that we can raise, that we can just celebrate. God, you have given Pam a kidney, and we prayed for that for so long. God, you have healed Olivia Heron, and we give you the praise for that. God, we are we're thankful that Deborah Baker's mom with the pneumonia is improving. God, we praise you for that. We praise for Debbie's mom with the things going well with that. God, we praise you for what's happening in our growth groups. God, we praise you that as a country, we are still free to meet here together. We praise you that our church is, Lord, just people are growing everywhere I look. God, I hear positive stories of what you are doing. Lord, I praise you that Kim Raider's family is with us this morning. I look around this room and God, I just see faces. I saw people at the early service that I haven't seen in so long. And and God, I just praise you for all of that. God, simultaneously, I bring a lot of requests to you. God, I pray for Pam as she goes back this week. God, I pray for Kim as she goes into the hospital. Lord, I pray for Walner's aunt and the, the, the delicate health there, God, and as well as for Barry, for Barry God. I pray for, for Charles's family. God, just when COVID first started, I, none of us knew anybody that had COVID. And now nearly all of us know someone who has died from COVID. And God, I just, I pray a special blessing on, on Charles's family. God, I pray for Elmer that you would help him to improve from, from the surgery, the intestines, and everything else. God, I pray for Deborah's mom. God, with the C. diff and other things, that you would continue to work there and to strengthen. I pray for Justice's friend with COVID, God, that you would strengthen this friend and raise them up. God, I, I thank you for everything else, God. I pray um, for Ray and his upcoming biopsy. God, longtime friend of mine. And God, I just lift him up to you, and I pray that you would strengthen him and take care of that. God, I pray for the military that's in D.C. God, I pray for the inauguration this week. And God, I pray that we would see a peaceful transfer of power in our country. God, I know that with each election, there are those that are in favor of it. There are those that are not in favor of it. And God, I pray that your will would be done. God, that you would give us opportunities to continue to shape our government, to shape our culture, to shape our lives. And God, may we as Christians be a light in the darkness. May we point people back to you. God, it is not about a particular candidate or a particular party. God, it is about you. And I ask that that would continue to be our hope and our focus through all of these things that take place in our country. God, I pray for Tanya's dad, Heiner. I pray, Lord, as they run tests, that you would raise him up, that you would strengthen him and encourage him. God, I pray... Um, for Franklin Gilmartin to be able to get a job, Lord, a friend of Tom Carter's. I pray for Dr. Richard Thomas and everything that he is facing, that you would strengthen him and encourage him. God, I'm so thankful that Debbie is here and that you are healing her and raising her up. And I ask that you would continue to strengthen and encourage her in every way. God, I pray for Dan Bailey's Ben Stoltz, Lord, with his uncle Ben. Lord, I pray with his kidneys failing and Alzheimer's that you would touch him and raise him up. 
And God, these are just the names that we are privileged to offer up to you this morning. And I know that there are so many more names that we haven't lifted up to you. God, I thank you for Abby's husband, Justin. Several weeks ago, we prayed for the biopsy and you made it all be just this normal, normally occurring thing, God. And I, I'm so thankful for that diagnosis. And Lord, I am thankful for what you've done. And I want to lift up the request this morning that weren't mentioned. Maybe things that I forgot to mention, God, you know what they are. And we want to be a church, God, where we take these things to you and we see you heal and we see you touch and we see you raise up. And we want to be a church that gives you the praise and the glory afterwards for all the things that you have done. God, we want to be a church that is not about us, that is not about our glory, that is not about feeling good in our service, but God, we want to be a church that is about worshiping you. And for that, Lord, we want to spend this time talking to you and asking that your name and your blessing be upon each person in this room, each person joining us on the, on the uh, simulcast, and God, even in our community and our nation, may we be missionaries, may we be apostles, may we be disciples, may we be ambassadors for you, taking your great gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to the world. God, would you continue to be exalted in the rest of our time together this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and continue in worship. You know, if God never did another thing for us, he is still worthy of our praise. Amen? Amen. So we want to, uh, we respond not just because God is worthy, which he is, but also because of what he's done, that in sending Jesus, uh, we know that he loves us and we can build our lives upon his love, knowing that it's a sure foundation. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
We love him because he first loved us. I love thee because thou hast first loved me. And purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. confident to love him all the way to death, knowing what he has in store for us. hope that you forever let your praises adore him. Let the amen. Amen means so be it. 
May we constantly, when this is the message that is proclaimed, may we constantly be saying, yes, Lord, so be it. That is our hope. That is our prayer. That is our desire in everything. And I hope that that is your desire. Man, isn't it just wonderful to be worshiping together this morning? I, I am so appreciative of everything that the praise team has been doing. It takes a lot of work to be able to do this, and I'm just really thankful to each one of them that does it. I'm thankful for the stage decor. Uh, this is Amanda Hand and her team, and what they did with kind of our nice uh, beachy theme here. And it's not just because we're on the Chesapeake, and it's not just because Bay Life is so uh, big in our lives, but this is really because our theme for this year, remember we talked about this last week, we are working to make disciples. Disciples. After last week's message, uh, Frank Mallory texted me and he said, I think we should print t-shirts that say all hands on net. All right. And I thought about that. And you know, if you've been, if you go way back, I used to give out t-shirts in the messages and I would every so often, once a year, we'd print up t-shirts and pass them out. Um, I think we're going to have to do that again. So if any of you are graphic designers and you want to come up with a design that says all hands on net and we can put the friendship logo on it, we will print them up for everybody, and that'll be a way that you can advertise that we are about making disciples here at Friendship. We are not about great music, we're not about great preaching, we're not about just a great coming together, but friendship exists to bring people to Jesus Christ and to develop them into fully mature, reproducing followers. Let's say that together, all right? Friendship exists to bring people to Jesus Christ and to develop them into fully mature, reproducing followers, okay? So that means we need all hands on net so that we can make this happen. We need absolutely everybody to be coming together and saying, yes, we are going to partner to make people disciples of Jesus Christ. That means you say, well, I'm not very good at it. That's right. You just grab your hands on the net. You look at the guy next to you. You see what he's doing. All right. You go to a growth group. You see where they're turning to in their Bibles. You turn there in your Bibles. You see them talking to somebody else about the gospel. You say, hey, I guess I can talk to you about Jesus. That's really all you got to do is you just got to share Jesus. Because we exist to bring people to Jesus and then to develop them into fully mature reproducing followers. Part of developing you into fully mature reproducing followers of Jesus Christ is making sure that every aspect of our lives align with Jesus and how he lived. And seeing as we've all gotten our credit card statements from Christmas... (laughs) The elders thought it would be a good idea and I agreed if we started the year talking about money... How can we bring our money in line with Jesus Christ, all right? And so we're going to do a three-week series on money, and basically, it's not just on money, but how can we live richly? Jesus came and said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And the reality is, for many of us in here, we are not experiencing a full life with our money because money is way too tight right now. We are drowning in debt. Or we are having more money than we know what to do with, and we're still, st- <laughs> wouldn't that be nice to be in, right? You know, or we're constantly craving for more, or we're struggling and trying to find out, how do I handle my money in such a way that it's bringing glory and honor to God? And first thing is not just give it all away. This morning, what I want to share with you is the first principle of living richly is the principle of contentment, okay? Now, I thought this was going to be an easy sermon. In fact, if I can ask Larry and Stephen, can you guys bring that white table up here for me? When I first started this sermon, I thought it was going to be a cush sermon. I thought I wouldn't have to prepare. I'd already worked out my illustration and already worked out everything um, and figured out we would have this done nice and easy, sweet and, and piece of cake because really all I was going to do in this sermon was I was going to tell all of us that we need to downsize a little bit, okay? And so basically, if you're the Starbucks person... We were going to have this sermon and convince you to drink Wawa, because we all know this is 535, and we know this is 327. You save $2, which is exactly 40% savings, simply by cutting back from Starbucks to Wawa. And I know I've already made a lot of friends, and I've made some enemies, all right? And then if you really want to save money, or maybe it's just the American dream, right? Once you've begun to master the Starbucks, what you can do, because you see, Paula and I have everything that we need. We didn't know what to get each other for Christmas, so we got an espresso machine. So now, because we got the espresso machine, and we got the syrup, and we got this cool little, I don't know what this is, but it makes me feel so cool, you know, and you got your little tamper, I I know what it is, but you know what I'm saying, like we get this together, and of course, Starbucks flavored coffee, all of this for only $200, which means, what is that, uh, 20, 40 cups of these will be saving money, right? Or I don't know if we're spending more now or saving more, but you understand really this makes me content because what I really wanted for Christmas was this. 
which is only $699. Pastor Appreciation comes up in October. You're welcome to get me the uh, Braville from uh, wherever it is. But isn't it fascinating how when we start off in life, you start off in college and you're squeaking by on your Starbucks coffee or maybe you just brew the K-cup or whatever, and, and then you start getting more money. Actually, college students drink the Starbucks. I don't understand that. How do they pay for it? Because mom and dad are paying for it or they're paying for college and all they have to do is pay for Starbucks. Then you begin to get up and you get to this machine. And what did Paula and I already say? We're going to use this one, and if this one works, then in a year or two, we will upgrade to this one, right? Because the American dream is about more, the American dream is about better, the American dream is about bigger, and my thought that this morning was I would just try to get us to back it down one step and just make it a little bit simpler and a little bit easier, and that would be a nice, great sermon, and that was what I was going to preach, but then I made the mistake... Well, it's not a mistake, it's what we do here, and if you're a guest, you're going to understand. I decided to go to the Bible, and I went to the Word of God, and I said, okay, God, I need a text that teaches everybody to downsize. You know, if they drive a $60,000 car, we want them to convince them to drive a $40,000 car. If you drive a $40,000 car, convince you to drive a $20,000 car. If you drive a $20,000 car, and convince you to buy a $10,000 car, so on and so forth. If we all scale back a little, we'll be content. Yay, rah, rah, easy sermon, go home. And God took me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, which says nothing of the sort. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles this morning, and I'm just going to warn you, if you thought I was going to try to talk you into Wawa coffee this morning, um, the Word of God is going to try to talk you into a lot more than that. I invite you to take your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6. If you don't have your Bibles, use your phone. However you get there, I want you to see these words because I want you to know that they are God's words, not my words. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to ask you if you're, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, I'm going to ask if you're physically able to stand out of respect for the word of God, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and let's read verses 6 through 10. I'll be reading in the ESV, your version should be similar. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. God... These are your words, and you know that these words were incredibly <clears throat> convicting to me this past week, God, and I, I'm still grappling with them and wrestling with them and don't even feel like I fully got them mastered for this, this message this morning. And so, God, I'm going to pray that it would not be me that speaks, but that you would speak through me, and I'm going to pray that your Holy Spirit would move and that he would take these words and he would drill them down deep into our hearts and our souls, and that he would draw our hearts to a, the response that Jesus would have us do. Lord, we want to be like Jesus here. We want to follow Jesus. And, and that's so much more than just the coffee that we drink or the cars that we drive. God, bring conviction through your Holy Spirit, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Being a teacher, there's some things in this passage that I want you to know. As a preacher, then there's some things I want you to feel and then we're going to conclude with a response of what we actually need to do. The first thing is to help you understand the context in which Paul is, is writing here. And he's, he's writing to Timothy, and he's actually not necessarily talking about money. In fact, if you back up to verses 3, uh, 3 through 5, 3 through 6, he's actually talking about godliness. And you know, the American dream is to get more. That's, that's what it is. You start off poor, you go away to college, or you go off to, to, to the army, to the military, you go off to trade school, you know, driving your beat up car that you got from your parents or that you got for 500 bucks. You land your first job, you begin to build up, you get a little nicer car, you, you get married, you buy your starter home. You know, the whole life is about adding more and more and more. And eventually you get up to where you're living comfortably and you're driving a new car and you're looking at retirement and you take nice vacations and, and that's the way life is supposed to work. And we take that same attitude to our spiritual growth. You're here because you want to grow spiritually. And so at the start of the year, what did you do? You began to add some things to your godliness. 
you know what? I'm going to get back in church. It's been a long time since I've been in church, and I'm going to go back to church in 2021. And you know what? I'm going to read through the Bible. I've never read through the Bible before. I'm going to read through the Bible. You know what? I'm going to try to get involved. I'll call Fred up, and I'll say, hey, I want to serve. I'm going to get involved. And you begin to add this and add this and add that. You begin to study the Bible, and you begin to get smarter. And you begin to get godlier. And you begin to get better because godliness is piety, appropriate actions towards deity. And now you know more about God. (laughs) <laughs> Except look at what Paul says to Timothy. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and doesn't agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy, for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth. Any of you ever been to a growth group where there's somebody there that's always, now in the Greek it says, now in the Greek it says, don't you want to just like wring their neck? Because like that person is smarter than you and they're smarter than everybody. Well, now what the Bible really means here, and you're sitting there saying, that's not what it says. I know, but in context, blah, 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 blah. Like it, and they have all this like knowledge and they're always like nitpicking your words. Well, what you said was, but I don't think that's what Jesus would have us do. Paul says, you know what, that people, you have to ignore them because you know what? They think that godliness, look at the end of verse five, is a means of gain. Do you understand the deep teachings of the Bible? I do. That's why I'm so spiritual. And I'm here to let you know that you're not very spiritual because you don't understand the deep teachings. I have great gain from my godliness. Notice all my degrees. Notice my teaching. Look at the books that I've written. Read my books. Buy my books. Make me richer because godliness is a means of gain. And Paul says, no, you've missed the point. Godliness is not a means of gain. But look at verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. What is contentment? Well, the Greek says, sorry, I got to do that, because the word for contentment really means self-satisfaction, self-sufficiency, uh, the perfect state of being. It's almost a new age-ish term. Contentment really is the guy on the yoga mat, you know, like, mm, like just perfectly at peace in and of himself. It's the opposite of the American dream. It's the opposite of Starbucks is better than Wawa, my espresso maker is better than Starbucks, and my super $700 Breville Ultra Espresso Machine is even better than my $100 Amazon Special. Contentment is saying God has given me everything. Because the Holy Spirit lives inside me, I am satisfied. Because Jesus has died for me, I am sufficient. I am good because of God. That is godliness. Not how many times you've read the Bible, not how many times you've gone to church, not how much money you've given away, how many kids you've adopted, whether you homeschool, public school, how many people you've led to the Lord, yada, 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 yada. That is supposing that that level of godliness is gained. No, my friends, being content in what Christ has done for us, that is true godliness, and that is gain. And here's why, because if you look at the next verse, verse 7, for we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. You ever thought about how you were born? You were born naked. We don't think about that too often. You know how you're going to die? Naked. I did Bobby uh, Bobby Neely's uh, graveside service with his family this past week. And I got to do it from his Bible, which is always really special when you have a believer. And The family was debating burying him with the Bible. They were going to put the Bible in on top of the casket because, you know, it was obviously a special book to Bobby, and I thought that was a good idea. But what does one of the family members acknowledge? They said, you know, there was like a brother talking to a sister, so I forget the relations. They're like, hey, if you want to keep the Bible, that's fine, because obviously he's not going to use it. You could bury the Bible with him, that's fine. You can also keep the Bible because, you know what? Bobby's not in that box. Bobby's with Jesus, and he didn't even get to take his Bible. What does Job say? Why did Job win? You know, those of you that are doing the Bible read through, we just finished Job, man, you thought it was hard. Job's perspective was right. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Contentment says I am happy not because I finally have the kind of house I want, not because I finally drive the car I want. I used to make fun of cars with heated seats. God gave me a car with heated seats. Oh, so nice. 
I'll probably wreck this afternoon and God will take away my car with heated seats. But am I happy because there's heated seats in my car? Is that real? I mean, do you see how petty that is? I was born naked, no heated seats, no clothes, no nothing. I'll die naked, no heated seats, no clothes, no nothing. Can I say, blessed be the name of the Lord? That, my friends, is contentment. That is self-sufficiency. And that is what Paul is driving us here. He's not saying cut back from Starbucks to Wawa. He's saying, you don't need coffee. (laughs) That hits hard to home, doesn't it? what he's saying. The message this morning is not to give up your $60,000 car for $40,000 car. You can still get heated seats with $40,000 car. It's to give up your car. I know. And I know some of you are saying, Robert, really? I mean, how are we supposed to come to church? You know, we can't come to church if you don't let us buy cars. Understand the Bible teaches intention, okay? You have to come next week. Next week is how to manage our money. This week is how to learn to be content with absolutely nothing. Okay, so this is a very one-sided message. Next week, I'm going to teach you how to manage your money. But I want you to understand, this is not just Paul's idea. When Paul started talking about contentment, I thought, you know what? Paul, I get this. You're kind of the radical guy. Everybody says that you're kind of crazy. I'm going to look at Jesus. You know, that's what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to call people to emulate Jesus. Let's take a look at Jesus's life, because I don't think Jesus would be quite as radical as Paul. And well, Jesus came and he said this. Somebody came and said, Master, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, you know, foxes have holes, birds have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If Jesus were here this morning, he was homeless. I think, I don't know everybody in this room, but I know most of you. And all of you that I know of have a home. In fact, all of you that I know of have a pretty nice home. Jesus was homeless. When Jesus was crucified, they took his garments, they divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to the bottom. So they said to one another, let us tear it, but let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. When Jesus died... He had his clothing to his name. No money, no watch, no car, no donkey, no camel, no chickens, no house. Jesus had the clothes on his back. The money was shared by a common bag from which Judas stole from, we find out later. He had nothing. The man that we are called to emulate died with the clothes on his back. Lived for 33 years with not. I'm standing before you right now. I have my keys. I have my wallet. I have my mask. I have my phone. I have my Fitbit. Like, I haven't even gotten through my clothes yet. And this is all the stuff I carry around because we feel like we can't operate life without this stuff. If Jesus were here this morning, he would have stood before you in his undergarments and a tunic. And that is the man that we have been called to follow. That is the message that we have been called to embrace. And it wasn't just how he lived. It's also what he taught. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Every summer without COVID, we generally go to Peru. There's months of training. There's even more months of packing. We have a packing party and we all bring in our scales because your bag has to be under 70 pounds or 60 pounds or whatever to get on the plane. And we distribute stuff and we take in medicine and we take in laptops and we take in iPads and we take in changes of clothes and we take in soap and laundry, all this kind of stuff that we're shipping into Peru. And Jesus would say, "Uh uh-uh, just go. Let me get a change of clothes. Nope, just go. Let me get my wallet. Nope, just go. Now, obviously, he lived in a different time. They didn't have passports and things like that back then. But the principle is that Jesus said, you don't need anything. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He obviously did not live in Soarnoka. The reason you moved to Soarnoka, Southern Arundel, Northern Calvert, is to give your kids the best life possible. Am I right? Because you are like me. When I'm out working on my edition on Friday afternoon and I see the go-kart turning donuts in the side field and I hear the dirt bike roaring across the orchard and I see Grace rollerblading in the cul-de-sac and Stephen going down on his skateboard, know that Ethan's at the skate park doing whatever 
50-50 grind whatever stuff he does. And, and then I go inside, and we got double Xboxes. We got the big screen TV, and we all kick back. And my kids are happy because I gave them stuff. I am a good dad. And I know that because you're a good dad, and you're a good mom, and you've done the same thing for your kids. But the problem is, as Jesus said, that a man's life doesn't consist in his go-kart and his dirt bike and his skateboard and his Xbox and his big screen TV and so forth. My friends, we've got it wrong. We are sacrificing our lives to give our kids stuff that will not save them and will not change them. And then we wonder why they didn't end up following Jesus because we spent our whole stinking life teaching them that possessions was what matters. That's the American dream. That is not the message that Jesus called us to follow. Sorry, this has been a hard week for me because anything I preach to you, I have to apply to myself. (laughs) All right, you have to wrestle with this for about 10 more minutes, okay? And then you can go out of here and forget it. I've had to wrestle with it all week and I'm still processing this. Jesus said, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or about your body, what you put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. Was not so- they weren't even arrayed as much as Solomon was in all of his glory. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. They're cast into the fire. Will God not clothe you, yo, you of little faith? Jesus says, I live my whole life with nothing but the clothes on my back, and I fulfilled the salvation of mankind. You live your life chasing after better coffee, better car, better house, better stuff for your kids, more fun for your grandkids, and what's that getting for you? Are you really content? Are you really happy? Are you really living life? Paul says, you better beware. And you better fight against these desires because he keeps going on. Those who desire to be rich. I don't want to be rich. I just want a little bit more. Those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Because the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It doesn't say that money is evil. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And I just wonder if trying to pursue the American dream doesn't lead us further and further from the gospel of Jesus Christ and from following him. This is why Paul also in other instances of his letters in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, sexual immorality and all impurity. I agree, man. We don't talk about sexual immorality. Man, that's horrible. I tell my kids, absolutely no sex but not before marriage, okay, and any of that kind of stuff, no. But covetousness must not even be named among you. Dad, I got to get this on Amazon. Dad, my best friend had this. Dad, can we research this on this? Dad, can I buy this? Dad, can you take me this one? Hang on, son, let's look at your allowance out here. Let me do this. My friends, if we're not careful, we are encouraging covetousness, which should not even be named among saints. We are called to put to death what is earthly in us, which is sexual immorality, impurity, passion. Preach it, brother. Preach it, pastor. Evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. My friends, when we desire and we crave and we want what we cannot have, that is idolatry. And so much of the American dream is desiring stuff that God has not chosen to give to us. And it is idolatry. It is prohibited in the commandments. It is prohibited as followers of Jesus Christ. If you think this is bad, though, I want to take you to the gospel. Because, my friends, if you ever want to understand the Word of God, if you ever want to apply it, if you ever want to figure out, okay, Pastor, what do we do, Robert? How do we work through this? What are you calling us to do this morning? I wish you would have just asked us to give up Starbucks and do Wawa and donate the $2 to OCC, right? Isn't that the simple sermon? What Jesus calls us to do is to understand the gospel, and that's what I want to do this morning is I want to take us to the application, really, and the application is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus Christ is enough. Is Jesus enough for you? That's what the gospel is. The good news of Jesus is this. We need to keep our lives free from the love of money, and we need to be content with what we have. That's what I've been preaching to you. How can you do that? By knowing that Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
The reality is, is if you have embraced Jesus, if you have turned from pursuing your own worldliness, pursuing your own desires, and you have said, I want Jesus above all, and you have embraced Jesus Christ, then he has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell you, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. And if God was faithful to him for 33 years on earth, and if Jesus never missed a meal, and if Jesus accomplished the salvation of the world, and he has called you to follow him, then he will be faithful to you as well. That's the gospel. And as you begin to recognize that not only is Jesus with you, but you also recognize that you're going to stand before him one day. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You don't get to take your credit cards to heaven. God doesn't care what your credit score is. You don't get to take your cash to heaven. God paves the streets with gold. (laughs) Do you really think he wants your money? You don't get to take your good works to heaven. You get to take nothing. And you stand before God naked and exposed. And he looks at you and he says, give me one good reason I shouldn't condemn you to hell right now. And you look at Jesus and you say, I got no good reason but Jesus. And Jesus said, if I trusted him, that his death and resurrection would satisfy you, God. But I'm pretty scared and I'm pretty exposed. And this is really awkward. My friends, if you can say that, and some of you are saying, absolutely, that's what I believe. And I hope that it is what you believe. And that is good. If that is what you believe, then can you please commit your life to it? How can you trust God for your ultimate salvation and yet not trust him to provide your day-to-day needs and material wants? Notice what Paul says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In fact, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I don't need a $700 espresso machine. I don't need a $100 espresso machine. I don't need a $5 stuck cup of coffee. I don't need a $3 cup of coffee. I don't need a, what does a K-cup cost? 25 cent cup of coffee. I don't even need hot water. All I need is to know Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I didn't just downsize and buy cheaper coffee so I could give more money to the church. No, I gave it all up and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not naked, not exposed, not trying to cover myself with my own good works, but I might be covered with his righteousness. My own that comes not from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. I don't try to heap up godliness. I don't think that I'm super smart. I don't think I've figured out the Bible. It's not about what I have done at church. It is about what Jesus has done for me. The righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. My friends, when I'm working on my addition and I look out for my kids... My goal needs to be not that they're happy with the go-kart and the GoPro and the skates and the Xboxes and everything else. My goal needs to be that they know Jesus Christ. And if that means leaving Calvert County to follow wherever God calls me to go, it means doing it. Because I'm like you, I ain't leaving. This place is too good. This church is too good. But if I stay here, this is not my resignation sermon. Some of you are like, oh, bummer. Um, But if I stay here because I want my kids to have the best because I want the best and I lose their souls and I lose my own soul, what have I gained? My friends, the call this morning is to be content with Christ alone and nothing else. Because I ask you this, if you are content with Christ and if you trust the gospel for your afterlife, shouldn't you be able to trust it for your present life? What if God did call you to take a 50% pay cut? (gasps) I can't survive on what I am on. Paul and I were talking the other day. Feeding 10 is a lot, but we could probably, like food and clothing alone, probably live on $30,000, $40,000. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of mouths. You could live on well under half my salary. What would happen if every one of us in here decided that all we were really going to focus on was food and clothing? 
What would that do? How would that change how we live? How would that change what we could do for the gospel? I'll just buy Wawa coffee, Robert, instead of Starbucks. Well, that's the first step. That's the first step. But what God is calling us to is so much more. By the way, some of you are going to miss this. Starbucks, Wawa, cappuccino, it's a metaphor. I really have nothing against Starbucks, okay? <laughs> this is not like an anti-Starbucks sermon. That's a metaphor to help us grasp the bigger thing. We could have chosen car brands. We could have chosen clothing brands. We could have, I thought about getting thrift store jeans, Walmart, you know what, Wrangler brand jeans, and then I thought about you know, Old Navy brand and then designer brand. You can get jeans for $2, $20, $30, and $100. They're all pants, right? And as long as they cover you, that's what matters. Sometimes the $100 ones have holes. Sorry, that's my mom coming out, right? <laughs> so anyway, what do I want us to do? I want us to understand the weight of the gospel. And I want to challenge you this morning. Are you pursuing stuff that's making you poor? If you're drowning in debt, most likely it's because you're buying stuff that you don't need. And I felt the pressure to give my kids Christmas. The worst thing was this year, they already had everything. We usually like shut off Amazon orders from October on just so we can buy like clothes and shoes and anything for them. But I was, I caved and they all spent their allowance. They'd already bought everything they wanted, everything they needed. And we're like trying to make up stuff to buy them for Christmas because, because you know, you got to give your kids stuff for Christmas. But are we wasting stuff on stuff that's making us poor and then we're not content because we have to buy more, more, more? What does Paul or what does the John say to the churches in Revelation? You say, I'm rich and I've prospered and I need nothing. And you don't even realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. You are chasing after the American dream. You're chasing the Soranoka lifestyle, and it is leaving you spiritually bankrupt. My friends, how does the gospel enable you to be content? I brought out the gospel this morning because it's only when you realize that you will stand naked before God and all you have is Jesus. And if that is good enough to save you, then surely the only thing of having Jesus in this life should be enough to let you live. You say, Robert, that's a hard call. And you're right, it is a hard call. And thankfully, Paul said this in the book of Philippians. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I have learned it, Paul said. It didn't come natural. Okay? I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. Paul said, let me tell you something, man. When I was a Pharisee, I've had good seasons in life. I've lived with rich people. Man, we drank good coffee. But he says, I also know how to be in prison and drink the sewage water. I have learned, and I know how to be brought low, how to be abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned. There it is again. It took time for Paul to get there. It will take time for you to get there. But over time, we will learn how to do all of this in secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. We are all at different financial places. Some of us in here are loaded. Some of us in here are flat broke. But every one of us can learn to be content, not by simply scaling down and buying the next cheapest thing on our economic level. That's the simple sermon. But we can learn to be content by how? By doing all things through him who strengthens me. Jesus is the goal. Not taking, again, you drive a $40,000 car, drive a 30, you drive a 30, drive a 20. It's not about downsizing whatever level you're at. It's about recognizing, I don't need a car as long as I have Jesus. I don't need a job as long as I have Jesus. I don't need a house as long as I have Jesus. Jesus is all. Which is why I ask you this morning, in what specific ways is God calling you to be content? For me, it's about wrestling with providing my kids with what I think is the perfect experience. How do I keep them focused on Jesus when, especially when God has blessed me and I can give them so many blessings? How is God calling you to be content and what specific steps are you going to take to learn contentment? I don't want you to leave here and say, hmm, that was an interesting message. I didn't know Robert drank coffee. I really don't drink coffee. I drink the stuff with all the sugar in it. <laughs> and that's why it takes all of this equipment, you know, to keep adding enough syrup and milk and sugar and all that to make it palatable. Um, you know, that's my excuse. That's why I can't just buy the cheap black coffee. I have to buy the expensive stuff. I don't want you to leave here thinking. I want you to leave here determined to make a change, determined to live a contented life, determined to be transformed. Because that, my friend, is how you will live richly when you are totally satisfied with Jesus Christ. That, my friend, is how you'll make disciples. That's how we'll live like Jesus. Can I pray for you? Lord God, 
I want each of us to be radical disciples for you. I want to be a disciple. God, for me, I've got to figure out how to teach my children contentment. And yeah, sure, we could buy more toys. We don't need more toys. What we need is more Jesus. God, how can we focus on Jesus? And whether we have tons of toys or no toys, tons of money, no money, tons of clothes, very little clothes, tons of houses, little houses, God, it doesn't matter if we have Jesus. God, may we be a people that not only follow Jesus, but live like Jesus, which may mean living with only the clothes on our back. May we do that for you, Jesus. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. My friends, if you this morning have never embraced the desire to follow Jesus, I thought it was just about going to church, Robert. I didn't realize I had to decide that I'd give up everything. My friends, it is about giving up everything. And if you've never considered that, I want to challenge you, urge you, and beg of you to consider giving up absolutely everything for Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity next Sunday. We're going to have a baptism next Sunday. We've got two candidates that have come to me and they've said, look, I want to follow Jesus Christ. And so we're going to have an opportunity. If you have never been baptized, baptism is an opportunity to say, I am leaving my old way of life behind and I am following Jesus. And if that means all I have is the clothes on my back and the food that I eat, so be it. I am satisfied in Christ alone. And my friends, if you would like to be baptized next week, I want you to grab me. I'll be out right in the back afterwards. I want you to grab me and say, Robert, I want to be baptized. I want to be that kind of a follower of Jesus Christ. My friends, it's an opportunity for you to do that. If you're a guest with us this morning, I would love to greet you in the back, give you a mug. We're going to give you more stuff. I'm not going to give you a mug this morning. Come back next week, I'll give you a mug, all right? No, because we don't want to just give you more stuff. We do want you to know that we love you here, and I will give you the mug. But what I want you to know is this. We're a group of people. They don't just gather together for cool worship and a sermon every week, but we gather together to figure out how to be more like Jesus. And if you want to be more like Jesus, I don't know where you are. Maybe you're just exploring Jesus, or maybe you're like dead set, or like, yeah, man, I'm a Jesus guy. Bring me in. That's what we're about here, and we would love to have you join us. If you'd like to know more about the church after the Sunday service next week, we have our newcomers class. We take an opportunity to just walk through and say, hey, this is what it is. This is what it is to be a friendship member. This is what it is to be one of us. It's following Jesus. And I want to invite you, if you're interested in that class, shoot me a text, shoot me an email, let me know, because we would love to have you join us and be a part of one of those who is following Jesus Christ. If you're not in a growth group, get involved. There's lists of them on the website. Grab me and say, Robert, all right, sign me up. Let me get together. Let me talk to somebody who's going to spur me on and challenge me to follow Jesus Christ more. Because my friends, that's what we want to do. And lastly, I always encourage you to get involved here on Sunday mornings. There's opportunities to teach downstairs, to make little disciples. We try to brainwash them when they're young. We really do. Because when you reach them when they're young, they'll follow Jesus when they're old. To greet people in the parking lot, to welcome people as they come in. My friends, I want you to be all about that mission. If you don't know how to make disciples out there, start in here. Because we don't know who the next person coming through that door is, how well they know Jesus Christ. And if you want to get involved, I encourage you to ask Fred. Say, hey, sign me up, put me in. I want to join the team. My friend, we want to serve Jesus Christ with all our heart, soul, mind, and strengths. And that's my prayer and my hope for you. If you, are, if you do know Bob Neely, last thing I do want to encourage you, at 1.30 this morning or this afternoon, we will be doing a memorial service for Bobby. And it'll be here live, as it'll also be streaming on Facebook, YouTube, and fcbc.church. All right? That being said, can we stand and sing? And I was supposed to do some cute lead-in, and I can't even remember what the song is, so, but I know it'll be a good one. Psalm 23 tells us the Lord is our shepherd. And because of what he's done, we shall not want. It ends with his mercy and his goodness following us. So we want to just confess our love to him and know that we walk in his goodness all the days of our lives. been 
so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire in the darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me all my life you have been faithful been so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God As we close out the service this morning, Steve teased a little bit of it, but let's cover the 23rd Psalm. We'll just end with that. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, leads me beside still waters, restores my soul, leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Church, if God is your shepherd, you'll have all you need. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Church, God's power leads us through those times that we're fearful, when we feel we're not enough, when we feel we're not good enough. Verses 5 and 6 to end it out. You're pr you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is preparing a place for you, church, as we worship, as we sing. Go in peace. Love you all.